Hey folks, the legendary designer Milton Glaser died yesterday um, on his 91st birthday. If you don't know Milton's name, you do know his work, and there'll be plenty of examples in the show notes for this episode. The best known one is the I Love New York design. Um, it was the occasion of Milton's 90th birthday where I finally got up the nerve to pitch him on recording a podcast. He was in the um, the Mount Rushmore list of dream guests when I was first putting this show together. And when I saw how active he was on his 90th and there were articles about how much he was working that particular day, I thought, I, I better do this. And we got together about a month later and it was just as glorious an experience as I hoped it would be. Um, I'm awfully thankful he gave me an hour or so of his time and that his studio mates were, were accommodating about it. Now here's some of the intro from last summer, followed by our conversation. Uh, my condolences to his wife, Shirley, and to all the people who've worked with and learned from Milton over the course of his career. Now, our guest this week is Milton Glazer. Milton, who recently celebrated his 90th birthday, which inspired me to, to reach out and, and get him onto the show, is a legendary figure in the world of design. Um, his work has transformed our world in, in both grand and mundane ways. Um, the thing is, like anyone who has created a really strong, iconic work, there are moments you can kind of resent when that takes attention from all the other work you do over the years. In Milton's case, that iconic work is the I Heart New York design. Um, so, yeah, just that work has achieved worldwide recognition and is part of our, our cultural currency since the 70s when he, he made it. It's become an iconography worldwide. But Milton's accomplished so much more over his, his 90 years. Uh, legendary posters and prints, including the, the Bob Dylan with psychedelic hair one from 1969, which we'll get into a little bit in the conversation. Uh, restaurant and, and supermarket design and co-launching New York Magazine and uh, co-founding Pushpin Studios with, with Seymour Quast, Ed Sorrell and, and Reynold Ruffins, and a lot more. His His designs are... Well, again, there are our common language now in ways that we don't even understand somebody somebody had to make them first. So almost any of his accomplishments taken individually would cement a designer's legacy. But Milton's done all of that and, and much more, including teaching for 60 years, primarily at School of Visual Arts, from which he retired last year. But that actually seems to be the only thing he has stopped doing. In recent years, at 90, he is still working every day. I joined him last week at his studio on East 32nd Street, which he'll soon be giving up for a, a more accessible place near his home in Chelsea. And he and another designer were working so focusedly on a project, I didn't want to interrupt them by, by telling them that I'd gotten my mic set up and was ready to record. So I just I just watched while Milton directed and, and Ignacio implemented and then as they they interacted and, and played with ideas and and photo sizes and type placements and and other elements and things that are completely natural to them and that would make this project look perfect but to the rest of us would take a million years and we'd end up making it look like we were doing it in comic sans eventually milton turned around noticed that i was sitting at our table ready to go and away we went now as long-time listeners know, I don't exactly get intimidated by guests. Certainly, there's a Mount Rushmore level of certain guests like Clive James, Harold Bloom, and people like that that I was a little tentative when I, I sat down with them. All of that said, I will admit I had a strong desire not to waste Milton's time. Not that I was intimidated by him because I think we really hit it off quickly and have a fun conversation. But I just got the sense that this guy's time is worth so much. Not that he's 90, but that every moment for him is a moment to work. And that's why over the the, the transom to the, the building, actually, it's painted Art is Work, which is a title of one of, of Milton's book, one of Milton's many, many books. There's no way to encompass the influence he's, he's had on our world. 
you may get a, a a sampling of it by catching the 2008 documentary about him, Milton Glaser, To Inform and Delight. That'll help you learn more about his work, his history, and, and the level of respect he gets, and not just from designers. Anyway, as far as caveats go for this one, there was some background noise in the studio. I think there was a window open, East 32nd Street, Manhattan. There's some audio artifacts from filtering out the noise from outside around the 10 to 20 minute mark. There's a little weird echoing. Also, I thought, like I said, Milton only had an hour or so and that he wanted to get back to work. So I cut things off a little quickly at the end. But we wound up spending another half hour talking about stuff and looking at pages of his next book, which he talks about in the, the show. He also had a great idea for how I could organize a book around my podcast, which was ingenious and which I never would have come up with. And he got that just out of an hour of conversation with me because he's Milton Glaser and I'm not. Here's Milton's bio. There are three versions of his bio on his website, miltonglazer.com. This brief one, a medium version, and one labeled Interminable Length. Milton Glaser, born 1929, is among the most celebrated graphic designers in the United States. He has had the distinction of one-man shows at the Museum of Modern Art and the George Pompidou Center. He was selected for the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in 2004 and the Fulbright Association in 2011. And in 2009, he was the first graphic designer to receive the National Medal of the Arts Award. As a Fulbright scholar, Glazer studied with the painter Giorgio Morandi in Bologna and is an articulate spokesman for the ethical practice of design. He opened Milton Glazer Incorporated in 1974 and continues to produce a prolific amount of work in many fields of design to this day. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Milton Glazer. Tell me about leaving this studio after 54, 55? 65. 55 years um, it, it's been. What's the process been like in terms of deciding what, what goes to a new studio, what, what you see as you start paring things down? It's like when old folks decide to move and uh, scale down their lives moved to a little apartment after being in a big house in Westchester. <laughs> it's, uh, the accumulation is an astonishing amount of stuff. I have the entire cellar filled with 250,000 posters, and not to mention everything else that's around, the originals, drawings, furniture, whatever. So most of it is just a, a case of getting rid of stuff, getting rid, rid of um, documents that date back... 50 years, uh, bills from paper suppliers, everything <laughs> else. So the most difficult thing is uh, getting rid of it, actually, not even choosing what to get rid of, but finding a method for getting out of the building and into the hands of either paper shredders or junk men. I, I did see paper shredders down the block as I was walking <laughs> here, so they're working on another office right now. They can always come by. But. It's a lot of work for paper shredding, especially <laughs> since the landfill uh, fills are full. Uh, so most of it is just where to put the stuff. Uh, and the, our new studio is slightly smaller, which makes it impossible to take everything. And not that you want to take everything in any case. Uh, the difficulty is just, for us, just the amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. Are there things, though, as you look back, is it that pairing away process that, oh, I really want to take this with us, but there's, you know, I just can't, oh, sure. you know. Yeah, yeah, there's some, except it, it has the same feeling of getting rid of those parts of your life that you're finished with, and also that uh, the burden of accumulation finally gets mm -hmm. to be too much. Uh, and people feel uh, relieved when they're not carrying around 700 pictures that they don't need. Any sense of retrospection? You've you've been the subject of monographs, etc. So I, yeah. you obviously look back on your work in the past. But is this an occasion for that sort of? Well, it's funny. Uh, to some extent, uh, I have forgotten most of the stuff. Yeah. My memory 
is flawed at best, uh, but I look at stuff that I did and I wonder how I was able to do it. <laughs> also, the skill that I once had uh, uh, astonishes me because I can't do that stuff anymore, nor do I have the patience nor the hand skills mm -hmm. to do it. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. I'm glad to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I feel extremely exhilarated by throwing out the stuff. Mm -hmm. But you feel that way when you get rid of these uh, encumbrances to your life that you don't look at it anymore. What sort of things were you, did you get better at uh, over those years? Thinking. Yeah. Yeah, predominantly thinking. And In terms of solving well, a yeah, problem my, or my just... My mind, fortunately, has not degenerated to the same degree that newsprint paper does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm working more actively and faster than I've ever worked before, which I consider to be a blessing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's bad and that uh, I'm embarrassed about having done, but that's the inevitable consequence of working. Mm -hmm. I used to put out a trade magazine for 20 years, so I know the, the <laughs> feeling of, you know what, right. it's over, just get it out, we'll go right. on to the next one. But, right. of course, you have much longer than 20 years of work with this stuff. Say the least. The... Um, one of my past guests actually profiled you recently, John Leland at the, the New York Times. Um, when I hit him up to ask how you were before before pursuing this, uh, he said, see if you can ask him about the difference between art and design. I meant to get that into the Times, but there wasn't space. Can you talk a little about the... Yeah. Uh, you um, can talk a lot about that, I'm I sure. I have a bad answer to that. <laughs> yeah. But, basically, you're prepared as because you have to say it at least three times a year, and mm. particularly when you're teaching. We'll design talk about teaching also. Uh, yeah. is involved in having an objective mm -hmm. and developing a methodology for achieving it. It's mostly uh, left brain, left lobe stuff. Uh, you know where you want to go, and you arrive at a, a way of getting there through a series of steps, largely subject to analysis. Art has nothing to do with that. You don't know where you're going when you do art. And its principal role is changing perception. What you do in art is you change the way people understand what is real. So those two things have nothing to do with one another, particularly because design usually is based on profitability. In most of the design we do, uh, certainly things like identity and corporate identity and trademarks and all that stuff, is about marketing and about achieving uh, more sales. Mm -hmm. It's about persuasion. Art is not about persuasion. It's about transformation. So you can actually see that there's no real relationship between those two, except for the fact that every once in a while, a work of design enters into the realm of art, which is to say it not only achieves a objective purpose, but it also achieves this strange moment when you change your view mm -hmm. of what the world is like. And the meaning of having art as work over the transom outside this, uh, this building? Well, that was my attempt to uh, detoxify the use of the word uh, art. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and not to make it something that uh, people use as a, a means of uh, a achieving superiority. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about art, of course, is that it's all self-anointed. And uh, nobody who performs art has any idea whether it is or not, because that's a judgment of history. So people can, anyone without any credentials of any kind, can call themselves an artist. And there's no disagreement about that because you can't say why they're not an artist, mm -hmm. nor is it of any interest. But the weird thing is that people with no skill, with no understanding, with no capacity for beauty, call themselves artists. And all you can do is shrug your shoulders. Yeah. Do you remember when you first saw your work in public? A piece of design of yours? Do you, do you remember that instance? It may be a poster or something that was, holy crap, I... I made that. Well, not the art you were making for fellow students. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. That. When I got out of uh, 
of Cooper, a teacher of mine, George Salter, a splendid man, gave me Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine uh, as a client because he didn't want to do them anymore. And I did a, a, a cover for Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, quite dreadful. Uh, and then I told him I couldn't, I couldn't do them. I couldn't do them within the, the genre that he was doing them. And, uh, but it wasn't for me. And it was printed, uh, I may have seen that for the first time, as a printed work. Mm -hmm. uh, I was disappointed in it. Yeah. Are there instances where it actually works when you see something of your, or are you always picking apart your things when you see them in oh, their no, final version? Some are better than others. I mean, yeah. I, I've had my share of duds. I also had my share of successes. So it's nice, but I don't look at that from a point of view. I, I like the idea that my work is public. I mean, yeah. part of a designer's mission is to produce public works mm -hmm. and also works that affect the public in some way. That's the most important thing about being a designer is your social impact. Although that is really not considered to be significant in the art schools anymore, mm -hmm. or certainly in the industry, what I have observed is that, uh, that largely because it's dominated by marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in those realms, in the realm of marketing and advertising, the question is never what is the effect on the people who receive this message and is it harmful to them uh, as opposed to how many items did you sell? Mm. So the uh, objective of design almost invariably is linked to economic reasons, mostly how many did you sell? And uh, that's a business objective, but it has nothing to do with being an artistic mm -hmm. objective. I will note that um, my first exposure to your work was unwitting. Um, the local supermarket in our town was a grand union oh, growing up, funny. so that was always the, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> the standard. Now I realize, oh, this was all <laughs> you know, a design that, that comes together. But, but when we talk about moving from this area to, to Chelsea for the new place, first, what will you miss about this area, not including having to walk up the stairs at, mm -hmm. at this point? Um, but also, what is, what's your New York as we move into another part of the city. Um, what do you miss here, and then what's New York, really? Well, you know, New York is a series of small towns, and it mm -hmm. also is so different from area theory. I never go above 34th Street anymore. I mm -hmm. just never find my When I do for some doctor's appointment or something, I, I am astonished how strange the city seems to me. Yeah. Uh, and doing one's life here, you live in a lot of different places. The first time... We actually. I was born in the Bronx and grew up in the Bronx and lived in a left-wing neighborhood. Uh, and then, when I got married, moved to the Lower East Side, St. Mark's Place, and then moved uptown to the West Side to a big apartment on 67th Street, and then moved down to Chelsea, uh, where we now live, and. At another time, went to Italy for some years, and uh, you only can see a, a fragment of the city at any one time. You identify with that, and other parts of it are extremely strange. It's like visiting a separate universe. Mm -hmm. it, New York is truly uh, incomprehensible. It just in a good way. So well, it's so mutable. It changes. Yeah. Everything changes when you move from east to west or up to down and so on. So it's a peculiar place to get a coherent vision of, mm -hmm. except we have a kind of uh, vision of it, which is yeah. not necessarily self-induced. It comes from all the material and photographs and movies and TV mm -hmm. as much as it does from living here. Although I, I encountered someone who epitomized the Saul Steinberg, New Yorker's vision of the world uh, when she told me she thought Jersey City was South Jersey because it's south of Hoboken, therefore it's just the southern half of the state. It's like, no, really, you're exactly that vision of, of a New Yorker looking out on everything else. Right. And, and um, With the Bronx, I've had a few guests 
um, who are in their 70s and, and 80s, and Jerome Charon and Frederick Tutton uh, recently, who talked about how almost all of their lives has been an attempt at escaping the Bronx in different ways. They both live in Manhattan, and, and right. you know, but mentally, the Bronx affected them in, in certain ways. On the other hand, with Barbara Nessim, when I recorded with her, it's just a, another memory of her, her youth. What's the Bronx mean to you, or what did it mean to you vis-a-vis -vis Manhattan? Well, I, I grew up in a very interesting, complex area. It was full of communists and uh, uh, people, Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe who feared the onslaught of Hitler left some years, because it was already in the air, left some years before he uh, emerged uh, and came to create a perfect workers' universe, uh, a utopia in the Bronx. There were, I imagine, 500 families. Bought a community of uh, apartment houses they had a, a complex, there was, and they actually bought the apartments, which was very unusual at that mm -hmm. time. It had interracial, for the first time in, in the United States, yeah. had some pe interracial people living there, blacks, a couple of black and white couples. Uh, it was extremely progressive, extremely intellectually uh, bound, uh, mad for a perfect... Uh, community. Uh, everybody went to college. I would say 90% of the kids went on to college, of course, at a time when college was totally free. Yeah. And they got a good education in the public school system, which was great at that time, with really devoted teaching and energy. Uh, it was under surveillance by the FBI constantly, <laughs> who yeah. came and sat in the neighborhood in their suits and looked totally out of place, but, uh, and then came the McCarthy era and, uh, where a, a lot of, uh, people were, uh, repressed and, and felt under siege once again, uh, and fought back with a lot of political demonstrations, uh, in that area and a commitment to progressive politics. Uh, it was extremely optimistic in that regard. I mean, it was full of the idea that things could change. Uh, it was a great place to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's stimulating, uh, oriented towards uh, education, uh, and uh, also isolated in the sense that there was a essentially Jewish community, an Italian community, an Irish community, they were all separate and didn't like one another. And uh, I say the Irish, a group of Irish kids used to come once or twice a year and beat up all the Jews on the street and mm -hmm. then go back to where they lived and so on. So they, it was funny, there were a real sense of uh, tribal, mm -hmm. even then, yeah. tribal communities, right? And, and that perhaps will never leave us. At what point did you feel the, at what point did you recognize the, the, the political air in which you grew up? Oh, very, very early. Had you, yeah, you, know. I, I, you know, when you were 10 or 11, you were already mm -hmm. witness to that, that we, they used to have Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie come and entertain in the, uh, in the auditorium uh, of this apartment complex. Then the apartment, I, I'm opening my book with a scene. The apartment's uh, rent went up a dollar or two dollars a month and nobody could afford it. And so they began to affect, uh, evict people from the apartments and threw them out on the street, literally. And I have a picture of my aunt carrying me out of the apartment with our furniture on the street. Uh, and when the uh, picket line saw the cops throwing out this little creature, Baby Milton, in the street, they went crazy and they start, they jumped on the horses and they, there was a, and the police began clubbing them. I have that picture yeah. in my book. Uh, <laughs> so it's the power we, of images. We began to know that there was evil in the world. Mm -hmm. 
in any case, that uh, that was a tumultuous and wonderful beginning. Mm -hmm. And again, it sounds like your your Bronx is more um, something you're more reconciled to, I guess, as opposed to something you're trying to escape and and you know leave behind, as opposed to some of those authors I mentioned. Um, but tell me about this book. Oh, I'm doing my final book. Yeah. Uh, Never say final, but go on. <laughs> I've done a bunch of books. Uh, it's like the Rolling Stones always had their farewell tour, and they kept coming back. They but... kept coming back. <laughs> well, this may be my farewell tour. Uh, I'm doing a book that is dependent on the idea that everything's connected, that the brain knows everything. It knows everything from the dawn of history. It's all in there. The title of the book, comes off a poster I did for the school, which is to dream as human. And I'm saying that the dreaming and art making are essentially the same activity. You don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. the, the dream or making the art provides a path. And that you find your path by beginning. Uh, it's quite the opposite of design, where you know where you're going, or you think you do. And you proceed, but in art making and dreaming, the art takes over or the dream takes over. You have no understanding of where the dream is going or where the art is going. Mm -hmm. It's a, an experience that we all recognize because we feel enlightened and expanded by that experience. Uh, and we don't understand it, and we never shall understand it. But the idea of access to parts of the brain that you didn't know existed and memories that you didn't know you had. So I'm showing also the relationship between all forms, between the ability to crosshatch as drawings and how that idea of the diagonals come about in a design later. That What I try to do is show that there are no independent events. And so the book is transparent. It can start at any point that doesn't have a chronological or... Uh, linear. It, it, yeah. Enter anywhere. And it also is a portal to other things that are online. And that I have an introduction to Morandi, where I write about meeting him. And George then I have Morandi? a talk on Morandi that's available online. And so I refer everybody from the book to electronics. I, it suddenly occurred to me there's absolutely no reason not to expand the knowledge base by the medium that is our per lives yeah, now, that permeates right? all of us everything yeah. else so and also because you, you you can't make any books anymore they all go with the rubbish heap so you want to make books that basically live forever the way a painting lives forever and that doesn't get put on a shelf the first time you read it and never looked at again mm. that no longer is possible in, in terms of staying alive so the book changes depending where you enter and what you read. And there are several points of view simultaneously. Can you so, talk a little about the the digital world? I know from what I've read, you don't uh, you don't touch the computer. I never do. Good. Yeah. Um, first, how did the how did the advent of computers affect how what you do and and how design works? Um, actually, let's 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 go with that. How did uh, digital tools change? Well, the thing about that, you you never know how they, they affect it. For instance, a, a pencil is a technology, yeah. and, and the use of a pencil changes people's perception of what form is, yeah. and that's certainly true of uh, the computer. The computer is a, an irresistible technology, uh, and. Uh, I say this often, it forces you to do what it likes. So w when you're in, you start using the computer, it's an unwilling slave. What it tries to do is move you towards what it's good at. And so it's good at replication and overlapping, and all those things become what you start doing without knowing it, because the computer has made it easy for you to use its vocabulary rather than your vocabulary. I remember uh, in late 90s working on trade magazines and we were allowed to do our own design as editors and all of a sudden everything had drop shadows because right. somebody figured out how to do drop shadows in Illustrator and right. yeah. It spreads like wire <laughs> Right. Also because it's attached to the idea of, of style and the moment. So 
it's hard to do work that doesn't look that way anymore. It becomes aberrational when you do something that doesn't look as though it's made by the computer. That's why the field of illustration has been transformed and the illustration no longer has heroic figures who do personal work. It has a kind of generic look to it. If you look at the times, 80% of the illustrative material looks as though it came from the same source. Mm -hmm. And that's because the computer itself has determined what the best and easiest way. I noticed that at the Society of Illustrators a couple of months ago, they had the the winners of their, their annual right. award, and there's only a few by other guys I've recorded with, like Barry Blitt and people like that, right. that had that, that human touch right. to them. Um, all of whom send their regards, by the way, Cuneo, Chardello, Blit, everybody's like, oh my God, you're getting together with Milton. This is great. Speaking of which, do you, um, the artist and director and music maker Dave McKean in the, the UK doesn't know if you know him, but just said you were one of the, the greatest influences on his, his career. Pretty storied career over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but I did tell him I would let you know that was... <laughs> Speaking of, teaching and... and your influence on illustrators and designers down the line. When did you first start teaching and feel you were qualified to teach? Uh, and did those overlap? <laughs> well, it, it it's over 60 years. Yeah. Uh, that's a long history of teaching. Yeah. I was hired by Silas Rhodes, the founder of the sure. School of Visual Arts, to teach a class. I had no idea. You, did you feel qualified at the time? No, okay. uh, but I knew I had to begin, and I wanted to teach. And it was a, a slow entry, uh, but after a couple of years, I developed a, a methodology. I love to teach. Uh, I love that sense that uh, you can impact people's lives uh, for the better. Mm -hmm. And you also want to share what you have learned. I mean, when you ask, well, what was my purpose? Well, the thing that I think of most is that I transmitted what I knew to others, that uh, finally there was a use for what I had accumulated, what I knew how to do, and so on. That went beyond me. Uh, and you have to, at one point, identify the fact it's not all about you. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that there are others, and that this sense of communal values and sharing is so intrinsic to the human condition and so overlooked. I mean, we're living in an age of capitalism produces the sense that the only thing that matters is wealth and fame. And that's a terrible basis for culture. So uh, you have to see how you get beyond what the culture itself has recommended to you as a reason to be alive. And uh, I would say that among the very uh, most important is the sense that you are part of a larger system and that you share in the values of that system. And it's not all about you. Mm -hmm. Do you recall, well, what you had to learn in order to teach or what you had to figure out how to convey to others? What was intuitive to you that you realized... I, this, this can't be intuition. This has to be, you know, at least a certain set of rules and, and practices. Well, I think everybody starts the same. They start with technical things. They mm -hmm. start teaching people how to do things. They, they teach them uh, specifically uh, on the size of typography should be in relationship to the color, et cetera. They mean. And they, they teach the working method. But uh, as I say about Morandi, uh, ultimately, uh, teaching is not about what you say, it's what you are. And people, the most important thing about teaching is to be something that the student wants to share. That someone like Morandi's devotion to his work was a lesson I never forgot. And Morandi never talked about art. Never talked about art. Talked about almost anything else, but his presence change you. So teaching is, is the, the student understands that. They understand what the teacher is as much as what the teacher says. Yeah. What do you miss most about it? 
Well, they only stopped doing it last year. I, I, uh, I miss the, uh, the sense that I, there's something worthwhile in doing it. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing like seeing somebody transformed by something you've said or demonstrated. Mm-hmm. Have the students changed over the decades? Were there aspects of students in general that, uh, I mean, I know obviously the technology and yeah. the sophistication of things they see, but. Well, the students at uh, SVA, yeah. for instance, now, there's been an enormous change in that it has become vocational, essentially, that all the students really want to learn is how to get a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that uh, model of uh, a passionate artist who's doing this work to, uh, because they can't help themselves or because they don't care about making a living has basically disappeared, but not entirely. Uh, under the weight of uh, survival and fame. Uh, so there's been a shift uh, towards, uh, I'd say over the last 20 years, towards marketing and advertising, dominance of marketing and advertising, which is all about persuasion. And uh, that's what the students are most susceptible to. In fact, most design observers or students think that uh, design is about trademarks or corporate identity. They don't understand that it's a small fragment of design activity and a rather crummy one, too. Mm-hmm. Are you able to turn off your design eye when you're walking around in New York, or are you sort of instantly kind of critiquing what you see around well, but, you? But as I, I told you, I don't think of design uh, as a sort of separate entity. I yeah. mean, I, I think... Everything is, there's no such thing as That's not, what I wonder, not it, design. I mean, yeah. design is planning. Mm-hmm. It's fundamentally having an objective of any kind. I mean, when you uh, go out to dinner, you're designing your dinner. I mean, you're thinking, well, I'll have a salty appetizer and a sweet. Yeah. That's an act of design, right? So I don't, I don't parochialize okay. design into Understood. segments, right? It, yeah, it's, I think ev- it was- it's everything. I mean, there's no... There's no design without intent, and there's no life without intent. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about drawing, the sure. importance of drawing in, as it integrates into your work and your, your development, right. and the comics that sort of inspired you when you were, right. you were learning to draw? Well, it started with comics. My, my idea about drawing is it's the only time you're observing what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. That uh, I, uh, my favorite anecdote is the fact that I sat down with my mother when I was, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old. And I looked at her and I realized I had no idea what she looked like. Yeah. The face that was most important to me in my life, right? And uh, I realized that the only way I would recognize her was by drawing her because then I had to be observant. And I had to see the peculiarities of the shape of her ear and the tonality of the color of her nose, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for the first time, I actually observed what is. It's in the Buddhist sense. To observe what is is very difficult. And that has to do with whether there is such a thing as reality and whether drawing itself is a way of engaging what is real. And I, I do believe it. It is, and the hand is a kind of brain that continues the neurological path so that when you draw, that goes from this brain to that brain, and it makes you conscious. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we're unconscious. And the way that filtered into who you became professionally as drawing, as you practice, it just is fully integrated in... in, To me, form-making is... It's not just profession. You have to be doing, and, yeah, and yeah. professionally speaking, if you can't draw, and incidentally, most designers cannot draw yeah. at all. And what they have is a kind of rudimentary anti-drawing method, which is a kind of rebellion against the act of drawing and tradition. Mm-hmm. And more history. of a schematic, or, or you know, just a, a well, bare bones. It's another generation, so mm-hmm. uh, you have to have something to overthrow. 
And one of the things they overthrow is the ability to draw. Also, it's hard uh, to, in, in the sense that you have to commit to doing it consistently. It's like learning how to p play the piano. So at first you have to go through these years of doing it before you can do it. And that takes time. I mean, I started life class when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing about it is that it gives you the ability to create form. And what if you can't draw, you have to find it, which is a different activity. It, uh, it limits you to what it has already been done. And we can say that that is not the best uh, situation to be in. Sure. Right. But we are living in an age of collage, which means finding the stuff and assembling it rather than making it. And that's different. Okay. Can you characterize that? You talk a little about and how you function within that world. Well, uh, I can make anything I can visualize. I can actually translate into mm -hmm. an understandable visual language because I can draw. And I can draw well. I mean, and uh, that you don't know what is beauty in drawing and what is observation in drawing. They sort of merged in some peculiar way. But it gives me much greater latitude in terms of what I want to do. I don't want to do uh, trademarks and logos all my life because I think there's such a small and limited uh, activity for somebody who is trained to fundamentally do larger things, more important things, more complex things, and so on. Uh, and everything impacts upon everything else. You can't change one thing without changing everything. So uh, I, I feel that my ability to, to make things is essential to what I've done. And uh, why, uh, to some degree, uh, that is less frequently encountered now. Uh, because mostly design is about First, it's about a, a previous understanding of modernism, uh, reductiveness. Uh, I started the, uh, using the phrase in my book of uh, gratuitous or ornamentation. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point, the idea of ornament became antithetical to the modern movement. And the idea is you've got to get rid of all that yeah, strip it all perverse down and, stuff yeah. and strip it all down and make it simple. Simple is no, no, nothing simple. So uh, I love the idea that things can be ornamental. After all, this is the appetite of history, right? There's no historical moment when people didn't love ornament. And so the fact that it's persistent for such a long period of time indicates something to us about whether you need it or not. And I, uh, I am so suspicious of belief because I believe, uh, I believe <laughs> that uh, closely held belief is closing of the mind. If you believe something, you, you basically have already prejudged You've everything you consigned everything else. And, right. yeah. So you yeah. can't look at anything without preconception. And that makes you incapable of understanding what you're looking at. That, incidentally, goes back to the idea of what art does, because art basically makes you challenge your belief, and that opens your eyes. Do you still find yourself affected by works of art? Works of art? Yeah. Oh, enormously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... You could still just, uh, particularly with, say, a uh, painter, you can stand in front of a canvas, well, the, or is it something... Uh, what do you prefer? A month ago... The three of us went uptown. It started the day by going uptown to look at Piero della Francesca, which is hanging at the uh, at the Morgan, uh, at the Frick. And uh, we went up for a half hour just to look at the three Pieros that they had. It was a great way to start the day. And uh, what else is there? I mean, also, they are truly miraculous works. There are miraculous works in history that inform everything we do. But of course, what happened with the modern movement is it swept away all those 
traditional references. I use everything as a reference. You mentioned over how every generation is overthrowing influences. Right. Was modernism what you needed to? Well, to we started Pushman Studios with an attack on modernism. Yeah. Which first of all, it, it was narrative, and the, you're supposed to be abstract. It, and, and we thought storytelling was an important part of, of design. And it was uh, eclectic. It used, uh, I used references from Persian painting, from Oriental watercolors, from uh, the Vienna Verstadt, all that stuff. It seemed to me was what you want to have access to in, in your work. And so we do. Mm -hmm. One of my past guests, and I won't say who to embarrass him or anything, um, mentioned his longtime interest in the fact that Pushpin overlapped with the Beatles and wonders between you and Seymour, who was Lennon and who was McCartney? And I don't know if you've ever, you know, contemplated that level of it. And was Ed Sorrell George Harrison? That was the, uh, the, the, the triumph. Yeah, Eddie was, was at the studio a very short time. Yeah, so he, he we, sort of gives we, him the George we thing. We came out of uh, Cooper mm -hmm. and, uh, and we got together and started to work together. And, uh, the nice thing about it, it was a, a community. We all worked in a big room, mm -hmm. and we all shared. We worked in groups. We all shared what we were doing. Everybody could see what everybody else was doing and participate in that. And that doesn't happen very often uh, historically. Uh, artists tend not to want to work together. Right. They do it occasionally and so on, like the Vienna Bergstadt and the arts and crafts movement and so on. Uh, and we were, we were around for 20 years. We did it for 20 years, and uh, it, yeah. it had ultimately uh, a significant impact on on the culture and on the history of design. No one ever knows in the moment, but did you feel that this was a collection of talent that was sort of pantheon level? No, we we, uh, we did want to continue the experience of going to Cooper Union where yeah. we were friends. And we liked that idea. We liked each other. We had no idea as... What you... The impact you were, were going to have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in the sense that we had no idea of the implications and mm -hmm. or the effect of of the work. We, we knew that we had a point of view that was not exactly the same as everyone else's. But but to know that it would resonate and grow like that is not something you feel. We didn't know feel. that. Yeah. Was it in teaching that you started to see somewhat of your own legacy? I mean, dropping aside any, any self-congratulatory bullshit, blah, 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 you're hugely influential within this, this world. Was there a trigger for that or a sense that no, you started to recognize? I, we, there were the a lot of uh, you know young designers who were coming up and uh, mm -hmm. were doing work that was uh, the truth of the matter is that we never engaged the larger community of design mm -hmm. because we were eccentric uh, and so we don't sort of fit into official design history exactly uh, what's that guy Sue Jack Guys, the head of the Victoria and Albert. Uh, yeah, Barbara mentioned his name when we recorded, and I can't remember right he now. He wrote a whole book about the history of design without mentioning anything we'd done. And I realized in the official histories, yeah. uh, I mean, you have you know, everybody from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to uh, uh, Gropius and so on. There is an official history, and Pushman never fit into that history. It was, as I said, aberrational. And so it uh, enormously influential without being observed by the design community as a force. And retrospectively, that it simply isn't true. We, that whole rather dreadful psychedelic uh, era, that way of drawing, which I now dread, but uh, <laughs> it, it had an enormous influence on design at that moment. Uh, Fortunately, it is largely passed, but... But your name is still on that Dylan poster. Still, so. <laughs> right. Still on and it, 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 it continues to sell more than any other thing I've ever done, except for 
I heart New York. Yeah, so. I was I was going to take a picture a day or two before we were supposed to get together last week, and I don't know if they told you why we didn't get together last week. I, My house was hit by lightning. Uh, yes. <laughs> you were hit by lightning? The house was. The house was. And the great moment was the next morning when the electrician came over and was fixing things and said, well, you could do this, this, and this in future, but you do have to ask yourself, what are the chances this is going to happen twice? So, yeah, there was that. But the night before that happened, I was in an airport waiting for my brother's flight to come in, and a whole squad of, of tourist kids go walking by with the I Heart New York T-shirts on, and I thought, Milton would either really like to see this or be very mad at seeing this, and I just don't want to find out by you know showing him a picture <laughs> on my phone. <laughs> so, no, why would I? Just that sense that it's it's everywhere. and, and Well, that's uh, weird. I mean, uh, yeah. also... Uh, at a certain point, it, it no longer belongs to you. I mean, it's... Uh, first, I don't understand it, it, it because it has become so uh, universal. It, it it happens sometimes, right? And you don't exactly know why. You've done maybe 100 logos, and this one suddenly yeah. explodes all over the world. I mean, in every country, in China, Japan, it's a, always yeah. a variation of it. And so at a certain point, it stops belonging to you. I mean, it just... An uh, old girlfriend of mine uh, on the first anniversary of 9-11 had it tattooed on the back of her neck, oh, and funny. that was the... Okay, this that's is... You know, I, 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 I hope she had it removed. Well, the hair's long enough. It covers <laughs> things, but you know, she just wanted it to symbolize her love for the city. Um, do you... Well, I know you have a, a home outside of New York. Do you get up to, to Woodstock... Much? I do. I I uh, sort of had a, an incident some years ago where uh, I thought it was a stroke and I wasn't able to walk. It's about a, a year ago. And so we stopped going to Woodstock for nine months, uh, but we've resumed that again. Because okay. one of my other past guests lives up there and I uh, haven't seen him around. And, and uh, We haven't been around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, we've never seen Iraq. We never go out of the house. I mean, yeah, that's, that's one of those. <laughs> when I went up there to record with him, I realized I, I live out in the woods in northern New Jersey, but the houses are a little bit closer together. Right. Uh, up there, I thought that's, that's privacy. That's, yeah, that's good. It is. Is there a, a sense of getting away from the city that's necessary for you? I, I, yeah, I think it is. I mean, it, uh, first of all, there are happy spaces and sad spaces. And our house is a wonderful house. You go and you're happy. It's also surrounded by green, which I think changes the mind. And just sitting in an atmosphere, uh, you cool out a little bit. I love being in the city. I mean, this, I have no... Uh, the city is a real chore these days. I mean, getting across town takes 45 minutes. It costs $35. I mean, things are, have become physically impossible. But Trust the excitement, me. the access... Even is, my drive-in today, yeah. I gave myself two hours to get from right. 25 miles from the George Washington to here. And madness. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to make it, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see how close. No, it's madness. Yeah. yeah. But, there's not, nothing like it. Right. I mean, mostly because of the people you know. Mm -hmm. And do you engage much in the the culture in terms of? No, I don't engage theater anything. anything. I mean, it's I'm really a, just people and conversation. A, a, a very insular life. I'm, I've been possessed by my work uh, mm -hmm. for a long time. I love to work. Uh, now doing this thing with Ignacio is so much pleasure for me. I'm very old, but I have a lot of energy for the work. Mm -hmm. That's great. You talk about collaboration. Yeah. The fact that, like you mentioned with Pushpin, how it was artists, yeah. all of you working together. And this entire world is is you working with your with studio, others. with others. Yeah. How does that differ from, you know, I guess, you sketching on your own, you know, making art solo? Well, you, do, uh, you you collaborate a lot with clients. I, mm -hmm. I've had wonderful partners. Uh, I had the collaboration with Jerome Snyder writing the Underground Gourmet. I had a collaboration with uh, Sir James Goldsmith, a terrible reactionary who I had a very good relationship with to do with the... He owned L'Express and then all these supermarkets that I did, the Grand Union, which was an enormous job, which... Uh, I had about 30 people working, uh, but then I realized I had suddenly become a, a manager. 
Yeah. And I hated that. And George Lois mentioned something along those lines also when it when you get further and further removed from right. the work itself the and work more itself, about personnel. Yeah. yeah. And so now I have Ignacio, one or two other people, because uh, I don't want to do work I don't want to do. Mm-hmm. And if you have a staff, you have to take work you don't want to do. And that becomes uh, a professional task, but it prevents you from doing the deepest, most meaningful things for yourself. So uh, I try not to do that. Are there signals when clients are interested that you're just like, no, no, this is not? Immediately, I can tell by a phone call whether I can work with somebody. And I don't. Hmm. The other day, somebody called and said, what would it cost to do a logo for a luxury condominium? That's the end of the conversation. I mean, I don't have to go a step further. Mm -hmm. You know. We all know everything. Right. So you can tell immediately whether someone is going to be harmful to you or nourishing. Yeah. If you accept the fact that you know. Right. And you're in a, like you said, in a environment now where it's not, you don't have to take on right. the bad client. Right. The, can you make the logo bigger guy? That's right. um, all, that, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> now, I was rewatching to inform and delight the, the documentary about you, uh, which I'd seen years ago, um, I mentioned the, the project you did on Dante's Purgatory. Much of a reader, reader, or are you, you know, it was essentially that book in particular, no, or that I comedy read, in particular? Uh, I, I never read fiction. Yeah. I never read novels. I read for information. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to read about behavior and uh, aesthetics. But I... Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't understand why people like to read novels. I, 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 I don't get it. I know you're supposed to understand the human condition better, but uh, I don't do that. Yeah. So. Because you understand the forms in the world around you, or you I spend your no, life interpreting those. I have forms? no idea. It's just yeah. a matter of taste. But uh, surely, my wife reads all the time. She reads. Every English novel that's ever been written on this. <laughs> but that's her life. Um, long, long, long marriage. Good suggestions for... for Over six yeah, years. Yeah. Uh, or does she have better suggestions for, for marriage longevity? <laughs> <laughs> or is there... Well, you know, the, the suggestions are always the same. It, yeah. Except what is. I mean, uh, it's very hard to do. Mm-hmm. It's very hard to be in a marriage without trying to fix the other. Uh, that doesn't work, either her on me or me on her. And you never, you, you never get finished with it. I mean, it doesn't. You know, one day that you don't come to an understanding where you both sort of we're complete. Ha- this complete, is, yeah. right? It doesn't <laughs> happen. I mean, uh, you have to learn how to. Uh, Argue and let it go. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you're two different people. You have two different values. You like two different things. You can't reconcile them. Yeah. And except for the fact that there are things that you will never reconcile, that the other will never be exactly what you want, is the first step. And then just a general sense of goodwill towards the other. You have to basically mm-hmm. feel admiring of no matter what the other is doing, unless you really want to break up. Yeah. It's just, it takes work. Sounds like you've worked that out over 60. <laughs> it could be like the, the sign over the transom, you know, marriage is work also. Right. But religion, ver- well, Judaism versus Jewishness? Because we're both I, Jewy. But, I feel but, very Jewish. Yeah. But I feel very non-religious at yeah. the same time. I mean, was there any look, sense of it when you were growing up, or was it communist enough that uh, religion was The left a, wing, you know, largely anti-religious, yeah. except the Hasidim, who were nuts. And so when you see that, it's not... Although I, I think the essential values of education and, and uh, being a good citizen are, are deeply Jewish... And that part of it I subscribe to. But I have no orthodox uh, yeah. idea. I mean, I think uh, all religions are basically devices to control others. And uh, 
when I see uh, religious people acting self-satisfied and authoritative, I say, you stupid fuck. <laughs> I've, but I understand its purpose. I mean, I understand yeah. what uh, religion is about. But fundamentally, I think it's conspiratorial and uh, of no personal use outside of the fact there is something spiritual in the world. Don't dispute spirituality. Uh, there is something called a soul. Don't dispute that. But the orthodox forms uh, are silly, I mean, fundamentally silly. Although probably when I'm buried, I'll... You'll uh, find otherwise? Uh, or you'll, you won't <laughs> mind at that point. Cause I won't dead. mind. I refer to Zen Judaism as my, my you know, semi-sort of practice. Um, regrets about working on Trump vodka? Is that a... <laughs> Yes, I'm, right now I'm wondering whether I should publish an anecdote in my book about Trump. Trump came. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he didn't pay his bill. He paid half his bill, as usual. Yeah. So, uh, and then a, a journalist came to interview me, and he said, what do you think about working with Trump? Well, he, I said, it's like most businessmen. The only thing I didn't understand was his hair. I can't figure out where it comes from because there's nothing structural about it. And how, what does he feel with people when they look at the top of his head and see this strange thing sitting on it? So Trump wrote me back. <laughs> he, he wrote a very funny note that says, Not nice, Milton. That's all. And I speak. Yeah, signature. in a giant handwriting. And I actually said, I sent him a note back saying, uh, you're probably right. It, it's probably not nice to use somebody's physical attributes as a way of undermining them. So now I don't know whether I should... Uh, I certainly would not do a job for Trump now. Yeah. At, at that point, he was just another jerky businessman. Uh, but uh, now I don't know whether I should include that anecdote in my book or not. I think so. It's still bad Bad judgment. I don't think he'll hold it against you any more than he holds all of New York against him. <laughs> <laughs> Final question. The, the Mueller. Uh, oh, yeah. Did you watch any of the Mueller hearing? No, I had it on my phone while I was driving in and thought I will lose my attention to the road if I it's, pay attention. It's on this afternoon, too. Yeah. It, it's quite alarming. Yeah. Uh, Final question, though, comes from Barbara Nessim, who asks, um, can Milton still do the twist? <laughs> I was a good dancer. When I, my feet obeyed me, but that's no longer the case. I probably under duress could do it. She's still doing salsa? Yeah, well, and, Barbara is another story. That she is. <laughs> Milton, thanks so much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. And that was my conversation with Milton Glazer, recorded July 24th, 2019. Thanks for listening. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.